Hi everyone, I'm Devin Moore. I'm a Humanity Rising Ambassador and the founder of Hashtag Race to Speak Up, an anti-bullying organization. Humanity Rising is a student-led movement to create a more compassionate world through service. We help students find their service passion and give them a voice to help them share what they are doing to make a positive difference in the world. Welcome to our Creating World Peace Through Unity Humanity Rising Voices podcast series hosted by Steve Sarowitz. We're really happy to have you guys here today. Joining Steve is Andrew Grant Thomas. Andrew is co-founder and co-director of Embrace Race, an online community of discussion and practice about raising and caring for kids all kinds in the context of race. He is also a race and social <clears throat> justice consultant that has worked on issues that include civil liberties, humanity rights, I mean human rights, <laughs> and social equity and philanthropy. And philanthropy. There will be time for Q&A and now I'll turn it over to Steve to begin. Andrew, I'm so happy to have you with us tonight. You know, race has been a, a really important thing in the news, but uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to see it on the news and it's another thing to actually do the work. And I know you're doing that work every day. Tell me a little bit more, we just talked about this, about how you got started doing this work, how you got started with Embrace Race, why you did it, and why you think it's important. So thanks, Steve, good to be with you. Thanks to Devin for the intro and uh, all the folks who make this possible. So yeah, I've been doing uh, race work for a long time. So um, you know, a lot of research, a lot of advocacy around criminal justice and employment and housing and education. So really all the big domain issues. Um, and then, uh, and my, my partner in life and in Embrace Race, Melissa Giroux, you know, has also in her own way been doing related work for a long time. Then we became parents and we have two girls, two brown skinned girls. 10 and 12 years old. And when they were very, you know, when we were thinking about trying to become parents, um, we, part of our thinking was, okay, if we're able to do this, if we do become parents, what will our convictions and what, what we think we've, we've learned about race mean for our parenting of these children? Um, and where will we find support to do that, right? To develop an affirmative kind of approach to parenting that accounts for identity. When we looked around for help when the girls came and we looked around you know, for communities and for resources, it turns out that there was very, very little. Um, there was certainly very little beyond the kind of, you know, here's how you react if something terrible happens. Uh, the only part of that space around children's racial learning that was occupied at all was the one aimed at educators middle and high school. So we thought, okay, maybe we can make a contribution in that space. Well, it sounds like you're really making a contribution. I know we found you uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting because I work with you as part of my nonprofit arm. Um, it's uh, so my, my family foundation is Julie and Grace. They do, we, we support over 50 different nonprofits but I'm actually supporting you through the, through the arm of my Baha'i giving, which uh, I cut off, I took some money and I'm just doing it for Baha'i oriented work and you're not a Baha'i. Right. But right. we found you. Um, is that interesting to you? No, it's very interesting um, and appreciated. I mean, you know, so, you know, that has to be said. Uh, and, you know, part of what's interesting about it is, yes, thinking about why we might be appealing to you. And of course, we've had some conversation about that. And I've spoken to one of your colleagues in particular about that. Um, and for us and for me to think about, right, how that, um, you know, why that might make sense or to the degree to which it doesn't. But in general, right, sort of thinking about how we, how your work, how my work, how other people's work, you know, the degree to which we fit into, right, a sort of an aligned fabric of work that will hopefully move us all to a better place. That's been actually wonderful to think about. And one of the primary teachings, really the primary teaching of the Baha'i faith is that we're one human family. And, and I hear Devin starting to say that. We've been talking a lot over the last several months. And I love it when he says that Devin was already there before he met me, but I think I've helped give him some words to better express who he is. Um, you know, I see beautiful souls like that. And I, I hate the fact that he had to deal with racism very directly. Um, I hate the fact that, you know, that anyone has to deal with it. 
I wish it didn't exist, but it does. And so, you know, what do we say to someone who says, I don't see color or racism as a thing of the past? How do I, how do you teach someone who has that attitude or what do we do? Well, certainly to the, you know, I don't see color. Um, first, we know it's not true, right? In the United States, it's not, it's just not true. Um, I mean, there is literally, right, um, a disorder called colorblindness, which is a different thing. It's not what people mean by being colorblind. You know, you know, consider this, right? If you think about, you know, for those of you who are watching this, listening to this, if I think about anyone I ran across today, I mean, in this, you know, in this era of COVID, we run into fewer people. But if I think about even casual interactions that I have, and this is true for almost everyone, I ask people this all the time, you know, you, you're walking down the street or you're driving and someone catches your eye, a jogger or whatever it might be, someone walking a dog. There are at least three things we, almost, we virtually always notice about someone provided that we're sighted and so on, right? We notice their gender or perceived gender. We notice their age or perceived age, and we notice their racial or ethnic identity, right? And if we can't place people on one of those dimensions, that, that means something to us, right? So many people with respect to race are, um, find it troubling when they can't place someone's racial identity. And what is so, A, you know, those of you who are listening to me say this, think about, think about whether that might be true for you, right? Cast your mind over the past day or two and to people that you don't know that you may have encountered, you know, and had, a, had, had an opportunity to perceive and see if what I'm saying isn't true, that you notice those three things, right? Try to work out those three things. And then the interesting thing is to the extent that it is true, and again, for the vast majority of us, the vast majority of the time, it is true. Think about why that's so important so I, see, if I didn't say, if I weren't saying this right now, even though your shirt, the part of your shirt I can see says, be love, I would not, I'm someone who is completely oblivious to what people wear, right? Now, clearly, the amount of space that your shirt takes up on my visual field is larger than the amount of space your face takes up. But I, I would <laughs> generally not remember anything. I can't tell you what Devin is wearing. Right, he's off screen, but I watched him for you know twenty minutes before we started. I can't tell you what shirt he's wearing, but I can tell you his racial identity, you know, my perception of his gender identity, and roughly what age he is, right? It's because it's somehow it's meaningful to me, and those dimensions are meaningful to all of us. That that's without even getting into the research, I think that's pretty compelling evidence. Absolutely. Um, another thing that I, I just did actually, my wife. Uh, tapped me last week. She didn't tap me. She was in Honduras and she calls me up. I actually texts me and says, get on this panel. The panel starting in about 10 minutes. <laughs> and it was about uh, this film called Coded Bias with uh, our friend Dory McWhorter who runs the uh, YWCA in Chicago. And so I, I went on and uh, went on a panel of a movie I'd never seen, but it was a really cool movie. Um, it's sad, but this racism or, or race identity has well, bias, you might say, has found its way into technology. Have you heard of that movie or seen that movie? No. Mm -mm. It would be an interesting one. If you could get a chance, please see it. Um, it's, I, I say that to everybody, but particularly, Andrew, with the work you do, I think you'll find it very interesting. But the odds of uh, computer, uh, I think they're fixing this now, but the face recognition recognizing me was something like 97%. What do you think the odds of recognizing you would be? Uh, under 50 Actually, I think it was 88, but a, okay. a black a black woman was like 68. It was it was. I mean, still, I mean, any disparity is bad. That's already significant disparity. The people who had it worse was a black woman. And actually, what's really interesting is that's kind of how it is in life. Um, is that women, black women, get it two ways. They get sexism and racism, which is, you know, a double problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, uh, it's interesting there because I didn't see that. I, that was something I was blind to. I actually thought black men had it worse. And then I started talking to some black women last year and asking them, and, and, and actually it was, it was helpful. I saw, I helped, I was involved with the movie. My company helped finish a movie called Invisible Portraits, which was a beautiful movie about black women. And 
it really helped open my eyes to the pain. And I, I've also talked, I, I have a friend, I don't know, do you know Joy DeGruy? Yeah. So Joy, I saw Joy give a talk and I've talked to her a little bit. And you know, as I talk to black women more and ask them, I, I realize that they're feeling more pain than I'd realized. It's just not, they're not in the news getting shot. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's the only thing I'd, I'd say in response to your point about um, sort of who's experiencing what, you know, it's just context, situation and how. All right. So, yes, uh, you know, black men and boys um, are definitely suffering. Um, some of what they suffer is much more dramatic. Right. And, you know, it's incarceration, it's in prison, it's, it's death, you know, homicide, you know, these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, Black women suffer among the highest rates of poverty, right? And they're the ones taking care of Black children in, in many, many cases um, in terms of single parenthood, for example, at least in the home, and these sorts of things. So, yes, yeah, Dan, Joy DeGru is uh, Baha'i as well. Am I right? Georgia, yes. Uh, I can yeah. tell you the story about her becoming Baha'i. I love this story. Um, how, do you know her well? No, no, I, I don't know her personally at all, but I certainly know of her work. So she, um, so, you know, I won't tell you about her work, but she, uh, she was 13 years old. Her brother Oscar was 18. And I've told the story a million times. I still haven't met Oscar. I really want to meet Oscar. Um, so hopefully one day I'll just have to call him. I'll have to, I think, I think we're Facebook friends. So I'll have to say, Oscar, you know, I have to just come meet you because I've told your story literally a hundred times. So Oscar was a Black Panther. This is going back about 50, a little over 50 years ago. So think of it, you know, 19, around late 60s, 1970. And Oscar, you know, right around 1970. So he's a Black Panther and he doesn't trust white people or like white people that much. And he's invited to this Baha'i event with these little old white ladies. And he goes there, and, but he takes a gun because you know, he doesn't trust or like white people. And he's had ample reason not to like or trust white people from you know, just a, a, lot of, a lot of things he's seen in his life. So he goes there and they're pretty nice to him. And it was interesting. He still didn't trust him. He came back and eventually he goes back again, he, you know, because they were nice to him. And eventually he leaves the gun at home and he starts reading their books. And he brings the books back to Little Joy, who was 13. And Little Joy read the books too. And after, you know, I don't know, a little while, um, Oscar became a Baha'i. And Little Joy at the age of 13 told her Christian parents that she was a Baha'i too. And she declared as a Baha'i mm -hmm. at the age of 13. And uh, if you knew Joy DeGruy, which I do, Dr. Joy DeGruy, you'd understand, you're like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. It doesn't make sense for an average 13 year old, but Dr. Joy DeGruy is a woman, is a, a woman, a powerful woman, wonderful, wonderful soul, yeah. very a brilliant woman. And I can't say enough good things about her, kind, and, but she's a strong, strong personality. And, and I mean that in a good way because mm -hmm. she uses her strength for justice. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, she became a Baha'i and she's still a very passionate Baha'i and I used, her, I had, I interviewed her actually because she has such a great personality in my movie, The Gate, and that's how I met her. That's great. So um, anyway, um, Joy talked about how black women, and, and actually in more detail, how black women have suffered. You know, I did, um, my PhD dissertation was on, um, you know, this was looking at the late 80s, 90s, um, you know, response to what was then called the endangered black male, right? And, and looking at the response uh, among black communities and the differential response to what was happening with black women and girls versus black men and boys, right? So much more attention to black men and boys at the time um, and trying to understand why that was. And I just remember this quote from, I think it was a 13 year old girl a uh, black girl in Detroit. She was quoting a newspaper article and she said, you know, black boys and girls respond differently. I forgot exactly the language she used, but the, the, the sort of heart of it was black boys act out, we act in. Right? Yes. And I think there's some, it's like, yes, that is part of what's right, of what yes. accounts for you, right? So different manifestations of the same underlying you know, trauma as Dr. DeGruy talks about, challenges in life, you know, different expressions, which we then pay different kinds of attention to. Yeah, and, and one thing that uh, she points out is 
these black women by and large, not always, but these black women are the wives and the mothers and the grandmothers of the black men and boys who are being incarcerated and shot. And so what mother wouldn't suffer with her son who was, I mean, I, I'm involved with a group that is of women who, whose sons have been shot by police. In fact, we did, that was my last interview here on the show. And uh, I'm very involved with uh, trying to find justice in the case of uh, Jamel Roberson. So I've become very, very good friends with his mother. He was a security guard. Do you know his, have you, are you familiar with his case? Yeah, um, I've heard of it, but don't know all the details. So, yeah, please. So Jamel um, was a, was first of all, he was a good kid. He was, he played an organ in multiple churches. He wasn't in any kind of trouble. He um, wanted to be a policeman. He was working in security at a bar. There was a, sh a shooting, actually multiple shootings. Jamel doing his job. Uh, there was a gun dropped on the Floyd Gray. He grabbed the gun. He subdued one of the suspects on the ground. Police were already there. A policeman by the name of Ian Covey came in literally like Rambo, pushed another guy who'd already been shot out of the way and said, you guys are always getting shot to this guy, pushed him down, hopped on the bar with his gun, which was an AR-15, and then proceeded to hop down and shoot Jamel four times in the back, all in the, case, all in the time of about two minutes. So you, you can't unfortunately prosecute him because it's really hard to say, well, it, you know, it was, here was Jamel, how did he know he wasn't an active shooter? You know, it was his judgment. And legally he has every right to shoot Jamel. Now in my mind, ethically, he has a, he has a responsibility before he shoots a gun at another human being to make sure that Jamel's a danger. And people were shouting uh, that Jamel was security. There's some conflicting reports as to what Jamel was wearing, but um, even if he wasn't wearing security, which I, he probably was wearing security, something saying security, but even if he wasn't, um, it's obvious that Ian Covey shot too quickly without giving Jamel a chance. And uh, I think that, uh, I think that, uh, you know, it, it, it was, um, it was a tragic circumstance. So anyway, I've been, I've been helping his mother Beatrice and, and she's suffering. She's suffering quite a bit. Um, and it's, first of all, statistically, it's a lot more black men getting shot. You know, you with a gun, me with a gun, two different reactions from police on average, two and a half times more likely you're gonna get shot than me. And, and, is, and I wanna say a couple things on this, Steve, and, and one of them is on exactly that point because, you know, there may be folks listening or there's certainly, you know, obviously these kind of circumstances are, are hardly unusual, right? We hear these kind of stories all the time. And uh, quite a few people hear these stories or would, might hear this one in particular and say, yeah, gosh, you can't, you know, the person has to react in a split moment and, you know, you can't know, maybe didn't see the security, whatever, has to make a judgment call in the blink of an eye and, you know, how can you blame this person? Well, one thing to think about is, you know, to follow through on what you just said about, you know, the likelihood of your being shot versus my being shot, you know, like play that scene out, however that plays out in your mind, right? And you're like, we don't know exactly how it played out because um, we didn't, probably few of us are aware of the story, but think about, you know, at one extreme as it were, think if, you know, that the person who responded and ended up shooting, uh, uh, shooting this, this man, Imagine if he had seen instead an, an old white woman, right? You know, or, um, you know, a young white woman, right? Might, do you think that might have made a difference in the likelihood of his identifying that man as, you know, the person who needed to be shot in that moment? I think most of us would say, yeah, you know what, that would probably make a difference. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to note is, you know, you noted, Steve, that uh, this, young man was a, a good kid, right? Um, which is uh, which is great and, and perhaps we feel, um, it feels even more tragic given that he was a good kid. Um, I just wanna note that you know, very often in these stories, you think about Michael Brown, right? In Ferguson, for example, right? Which sort of set off the whole Black Lives Matter movement. In the Michael Brown case, in so many of the cases where young black men or older black men are shot, the newspaper coverage very quickly turns to whether or not they were, or the degree to which they were good people, right? Did they have criminal records, you know, George Floyd, right, et cetera. You know, he had tried to pass a counterfeit bill, possibly, 
Um, I'm obviously not saying, Steve, that you did this, but this is a thing that we need to be really, really careful about, right? Because of course, and maybe when I say of course, and now perhaps, you know, it seems obvious to all of us, but of course it doesn't matter. No, right? um, I, I, one thing, I, the, only, the only thing that I would say, and the reason why I said he's a good kid, well, first of all, because I'm close to the family, but there's also wow. one other thing that there's a lot of people who are fond of guns who say, well, all you need is a good guy with a gun. And so one of the one of the things we're saying, this was a this is your good guy with a gun. Mm -hmm. And he was doing his job. So it wasn't just like he had a gun. He was literally mm -hmm. using that gun to save lives. He was a hero. Right. And so he, you know, so it was beyond, it was beyond that, you know, here was a criminal and the cops went too far because they he should he used excess force against the person who was criminal. Far, you know, in, in many of these cases far too much excess force, which is still wrong and still not how we want to have our society. But this is well beyond that. This guy, the, the policeman actually shot a hero yeah. who was on no threat to him, would have never been a threat to him, you know, Jamel. And, and so um, a lot of times also, I think what they're trying to do in these cases is, is they're trying to smear the character of, of, of the person getting shot and make it again on them. And, as, and I think that's the point you're making is it doesn't matter. Police, policemen shouldn't be using excessive force and I couldn't agree more. And we just I, need to be really careful because it's, it's really, if we're not critical, right? It becomes tempting to read about, you know, you know, some, you know, he was no angel. I mean, we hear that all the time. He was no angel as if again, you know, someone who was quote unquote, no angel deserves to be shot for, you know, because he's pulled over for a broken tailpipe or whatever. And no, right, let's not be, let's not give into that kind of, a, that kind of, the, the seduction, the seduct seductiveness of that kind of appeal. Well, Christ says, um, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Indeed. And, and Baha'u'llah says, breathe not the sins of others so long as thou art thyself a sinner. And so, you know, none of us is without sin. None of us is perfect. And so we really, and, and the other thing that the Baha'i writings teach and also the, also the Bible and pretty much every religion teaches is don't look at your own faults. Look, don't look at other people's faults, other people's faults, look at your own. And we're doing this, this to me, it's, it's, a, it's a, a ruse to really, it's, it's, a, it's, something, it's, it's a distraction to get us off the main subject, which is the excessive use of force by police in yeah. this country. And, and we should really compare ourselves, and I've done this many times to people, to other countries and say, look, you know, it's not, it's like a hundred to one against some other countries. I don't want to live in a country where I'm a hundred times, well, I'm probably not. You're, I don't want to live in a, I don't, I don't want you to have to live in a country where you're maybe 200 times is more likely to be shot. And, and even I'm 10 times more likely to be shot or whatever that, whatever the stats are, you're two and a half times. So let's say you're 200 times more likely and I'm uh, 80 times more likely to be shot by a policeman than let's say I would be in Great Britain or in another country. And this is an, and this is another thing I just want to underline for folks again listening is thinking about in these you know police involved encounters where someone gets shot. You know another thing we often hear right is well he she they shouldn't have run right it shouldn't have done this shouldn't have done that. You know really and and we need to think about yeah so when is it right if a police officer pulls his or her weapon, uh, they are trained to kill people right if they're going to pull and pull and shoot it's to kill, right? They're not shooting to, to wound typically. And then the question is, uh, under what circumstances do we think that should be justified? Um, and it's, I think it's hard, I think few of us would flat out make the case that someone running away from you, unarmed and, and posing no danger to anyone else is a circumstance under which we want police to kill, right? So again, there are these arguments that are made, you know, yeah, he, he was no angel, why was he running away? You know, he shouldn't have done this. To my mind, and I think, anyway, to my mind, if no one, if, if, the, uh, if the person is posing no imminent threat of harm to someone, whether it's the officer or somebody else, we shouldn't be using deadly force in those circumstances. And it is possible one of the reasons they're running away is because of the use of deadly force, that the person panics and runs away. Indeed. I mean, that's a very <laughs> stressful situation, knowing that you could be shot. So it all feeds itself. Um, I am very much, a, I wouldn't say as I'm a full pacifist as a Baha'i, but I'm pretty close. I'm always looking to, to do unity and peace. 
And so all of this bothers me. It always has. I've never been one to be into violence. I always said, I'm a runner. I could run for help. Um, you get, if you want to fight, I could run for help. But uh, I think that um, it's, just, it's just a shame in this country that there's so many shootings. It's just a shame that we, you know, people, there's a lot of people who are pro-gun in this country. I, I believe in freedom. I believe that people should have some freedom to have guns, but they should be far better regulated than they are in this country. And it should, there should be a much higher bar to have a gun. Well, and frankly, I think there should be a lot fewer guns. And um, on that note, I mean, you may well know, many of the folks listening may well know that there is a run on guns right now. I do. I mean, there, there, there are lines around blocks of you know, gun stores across this country um, because people are really fearful, number one, of what the election will bring, the post-election and so on. Um, and because they think, you know, that's one thing, and because they think that uh, arming themselves, uh, you know, is a hedge against that fear and a hedge against what may happen in the wake. And that's, that's, really, that's really worth thinking through. I'm, uh, I've never owned a gun, uh, never will. I mean, I say never, never say never, but nine, chances are I'll never own a gun, never have any desire. Um, but uh, I don't mind if someone would own a gun. I would think that I just like fewer people to own guns. And frankly, I, I, I don't like this idea of operating out of fear. Now, of course, I live in a nice leafy suburb and there's not a lot of danger here. Um, we're getting to the question and this question popped up so Debbie's probably reminding me that we're, we're almost over time. Let me look at the time. Um, believe it or not, we've been talking for a half an hour already. Does it seem like five minutes? It's been quick. Um, let me ask you a little, little bit more about Embrace Race. How, um, what age people, what age, what age uh, students do you focus on our parents? Uh, uh, parents of what age children? Yeah, so really our focal uh, sort of constituency are parents and other adults in the lives of children from birth through middle school. So roughly 12, 13 and younger. And the reason for that is uh, because we know that children are developing their ideas, their attitudes around race, essentially as soon as they're born, right? Um, you know, so they have preferences toward their, the, the people who look like their caregivers, right? It's about the familiarity to begin with. Uh, but sometime around three, four years old, it starts to deepen into something a little bit different, a little bit more harmful. Um, and then by the time kids are adolescents, those racial now sort of recognizably racial attitudes become a bit more embedded, a little bit more calcified and harder to move. So the opportunity then to shape, you know, the content of those racial uh, attitudes and sensibilities are when the kids are really quite young, right? Two years old, three, four, five years old and so on. So that's, that's our focus. And again, it's mostly parents of all uh, racial ethnic identities and their children, uh, educators, and then all the other caregivers in their lives. Thank you for the work you do. And like I said, I'm, I'm with you side by side and, and helping. Onward and upward, both of you. Thank you both. Devin, thank you as usual. And good night, everybody. And thanks for joining us. Good night. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye.